Here we want to talk about a class of statements that, for lack of a better term, I'm just going to call the unless statements. And uh, these statements are members in a family of statements that are called conditional statements or、uh, conditional logic, right? And other members include if claims, only if claims, and there are others that I won't list now.、Uh, we'll get into more detail about conditional logic when we do. Must be true and sufficient assumption questions and conditional statements themselves are actually members, right, of a larger family called formal logic, right, formal logic. So、uh, here I just want to talk about this very tiny thing. Unless、um, it's, I want to talk about it because it, you know it gives a, a lot of students have trouble understanding unless claims on the LSAT and unless claims are just I, th I think inherently they're just harder to understand than、um, say an if then claim. So. Really, the object here—you don't have to do this. If you if you intuitively have a good relationship, let's say with unless, then you can you can just like fast forward past this lesson. But if unless claims give you trouble, the solution is to translate unless claims into if then claims. Okay, translate unless claims into if dot 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 then dot 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 claims. All right. Now, if you translate correctly, then this is the easier to understand claim. The danger, of course, with any translation is mistranslation, right? What gets lost in translation if you don't translate it correctly?、Uh, so let's take a look at an example, and here I want to appeal to your intuition, and also I'll appeal to、uh, a just tried and true mechanical way of translating. The claim is: unless we negotiate a tax deal with the governor of South Carolina, we will have to open our new factory in New York, right? So let's just make some、um, state some assumptions about. The context, okay. You are the CEO.、Uh, this is the this is the order that's been handed to you from your board of directors, right? So, and you, and you sent a negotiator, a chief negotiator. You sent to South Carolina to work something out with the governor. And the directive from your board is: unless we can negotiate a deal, we're going to have to open our new factory in New York. So, first intuition, right? Just appeal to your intuition. Let's say your chief negotiator comes back and says. Uh, sorry, boss. You know, I try my best, but、uh, no deal, no deal there. So then what? Well, according to the statement, then what is then we have to open our new factory in New York, right? That that, that I feel like is pretty clear. So the if then claim in that instance is if we don't get the tax deal with the governor of South Carolina, then we will have to open our factory in New York. That's the claim, right? And that's the correct translation. That's the correct understanding. Now what's And this is a good litmus test for whether the way you intuitively understand. Remember earlier, I said if your intuition, you have a good intuitive relationship with unless, you can skip this lesson, right? So here's a good litmus test for whether you do have a good、uh, intuitive understanding of this word unless. What happens if your chief negotiator comes back and says, "Good news, I got the deal we wanted, right? The, the governor of South Carolina is giving us the tax break that we want. Then what?" Now, if your intuition tells you, well, great, then we're not opening our new factory in New York, right? Well, presumably, we're opening it in South Carolina. Then the way you intuitively understand unless is not the way the LSAT writers want you to understand. Or I shouldn't say want you. What do I know about what the LSAT writers want? They probably want you to miss questions. But it's certainly not the way that the LSAT writers un understand this word unless. And the burden is, of course, on us to conform the way we understand this word. To the way that the LSA writers understand the word "unless," okay, and the way they understand "unless" is that if your chief negotiator comes back and tells you that they got she got a tax deal with the governor of South Carolina, then you have options. You have options. You could still open your new factory in New York if you want. You don't have to open your new factory in New York if you don't want, right? That's the big difference. So the if-then translation here is if no tax deal. Right. If no tax deal from South Carolina, then for sure new factory is in New York. If there is a tax deal in South Carolina, then what? Then nothing. Then question mark. Right. Or another way you want to think about it is that this world bifurcates. You you could open it in New York if you want. You could open it in South Carolina if you want. I, I mean, do you actually have other options? I'm not sure. Maybe you want to open it in North Carolina because why not? Right. But do you see the point? Is this is not the world. About which this claim says something very meaningful, right? This is the world about which the claim says something meaningful. In other words, the way you want to translate. Remember, I said the if-then translation is what we're targeting, right? The, the if-then is if no tax deal from South Carolina, then new factory in New York. That's the translation you want to、um, you want to come away with. Okay, so 
Intuitively, I hope this makes sense. Now, the way to do this mechanically is you have to, uh, here we have to apply a bit of grammar to this, right? Um, I, I want to call your attention. Now, we, we've done some lessons on grammar at this point. I want to call your attention to the fact that you can look at this one sentence and actually just break it up into three different chunks, okay? Here's chunk number uh, three. Uh, here's chunk number one. Here's chunk number two. Why do I break it up? Why do I chunk it up like this? Because if you look at this first bit in between what I labeled one, notice it's a complete sentence. We negotiate a tax deal with the governor of South Carolina. That's just complete. You got a subject, you got a verb, you got the predicate, right, with the object as well. Look at sentence number two, same thing. We will have to open our new factory. Like, if none of these other words existed, this is a full and complete sentence, right? And same with this. If none of the other words existed, this is a full and complete sentence. So what the unless is doing here, grammatically, it's just operating as glue. If you've taken some kind of logic class in, in college, right, the technical term for this word is connector. It's a logical connector. In fact, it's the main logical connector of this claim. The, I mean, you can think of it as glue because what it's really doing is just gluing one and two together. Right, like one and two, one could be like playing over here, two is like walking around over here, they got nothing to do with each other until three comes along and like, nope, let, let, I'm going to bring you over here, I'm going to bring you over here, and now I'm going to glue the two of you together to form this sentence. Now you two have a relationship, right? Before you weren't even aware of each other's existence, because of me, you're going to have a relationship, you're going to have a very specific kind of relationship, and unless relationship, okay? And the way you want to treat unless, and um, there are rules for how to deal with um, logical connectors in, in the full curriculum. But here I'll just talk about the unless. You just want to think of these two words, negate, sufficient. Okay, these are the two words you want to remember. Every time you see a word unless, negate, sufficient, negate, sufficient. What does that mean? Well, you have to go through this grammar exercise of identifying the unless as the glue, as the logical connector. You have to go through this grammar exercise of identifying the two different clauses Right, the two different clauses that's being glued together. And then what you have to do is you have to negate one of the clauses. Right, negate one of the clauses. So here, let's say, let's negate one. Right, and then the clause that you negate, make it the sufficient condition, which just means, right, which just means make it the if condition, right? The if condition. So, okay, so that means I'm going to put it like this, right? If one slash then... Right, the arrow is just the then is read to be meant to be read as then, then two. If one slash then two. Right? If one slash then two. What now now you swap in the content of one and two. If what? If we negotiate a tax deal with a governor of South Carolina, ah, but it's supposed to be negated, slashed, right? So if we don't negotiate tax deal with the governor of South Carolina, then what? Then we have to open our factory in New York. That's it. All right. So at some point, I mean initially you can start by doing this. At some point you just get comfortable enough with this kind of notation that you drop the if then that you start just writing it like this one slash arrow two where you know the arrow is meant to be it indicates that oh this thing i'm going to read as if and this thing i'm going to read as then right that's what really what the arrow is but until you get comfortable with it you feel free to write it like this if this thing arrow with a then on top of it two okay so the mechanical way again the mechanical way of translating is first identify your logical indicator then identify the two ideas that's being connected by the logical indicator. Then you pick one of these ideas, you negate it, and make it the sufficient idea, right? which we did that over here with a one, we negated it, made the sufficient, which means the, the if idea. And the other idea is just, you know, stays the same and drops into the uh, then slot. All right, let's practice this with another claim. On first glance, this claim might seem to be simpler because it's shorter, but um, I... I submit to you this actually more ambiguous, but anyway, first let's just identify the logical indicator on less, right? And here, I think it is situated better. I tend to think of glues as being, you know, in the middle of the two pieces that are being stitched together. And here, they just make it easy for us. In the previous sentence, there was a comma that you had to, you had to spot. But Notice once again that the unless is just connecting together what otherwise would be two complete and independent sentences, right? We don't need this part. Wendy's not getting puppy. That's a full complete sentence, subject, verb, and the, the predicate being here. Right? And same over here. She gets straight A's. Complete sentence. The she here is referential phrasing to Wendy. And what the unless is doing is like, you know, 
this statement, Wendy is not getting a puppy, has nothing to do with this statement, Wendy gets straight A's, right? These are just two separate statements. Ah, but the unless is like, no, 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 come together. You two now have a relationship. There's something going on between you two now. And it's a specific kind of relationship. It's an unless relationship. Our job is to understand what it means for the relationship to be an unless relationship. So again, two things you can do here, intuition and mechanical translation. Let's follow the mechanical rules. See if you recall it. Right? What was the, you know, when I said unless, what, 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 what was over here? It was, it was actually over here. What was it? Do you remember? Negate sufficient, right? Negate sufficient. And and what, is that, what does that mean again, negate sufficient? What was sufficient, I said? You can think of sufficient as just the if claim, right? As the if claim. Ah, okay, so we have this if something arrow, then, right? Then something else, right? So the idea here is you, you negate something and you make it the sufficient condition. So when he's not getting puppy, unless she gets straight A. So here, let's, let's uh, this is the straight A's claim, right? This is a uh, not getting puppy claim, right? Let's pick this claim, let's negate this claim and make it the sufficient condition, which means if Wendy's not getting straight A's, then what? Then Wendy is not getting a puppy, right? This, we don't do anything with this claim. This claim just drops down exactly the way it is. And you, you might notice that it already has a negation in it. That's fine, right? It, you don't do anything to it it drops down exactly the way it is. So you have to carry everything in it down to where it is, right? It's, it's only this first bit, the, the if slot, that, that whatever you're dropping into the if slot that you're slapping a negation onto. So there's the mechanical way of translating it. And you, you go from an unless statement to a much clearer if then statement. This, this is like, you know, this is something that Wendy can understand. If you, Wendy doesn't get straight A's, then she's not getting a puppy. Wendy's like, gotcha, I understand this, right? Whereas this, I don't know, it depends on, <laughs> depends on how sophisticated Wendy is, depends on, um, I don't know, her parents, that have they taught her what unless means, right? This, this could be a, a way for parents to be kind of mean to Wendy, right? Because here's the thing, what happens if Wendy does get straight A's, right? What happens if Wendy does get straight A's? Now, you might be tempted to say, if Wendy gets straight A's, she's for sure getting a puppy, right? I mean, because surely that's what the claim has to mean. If Wendy gets straight A's, she's getting a puppy. Now, again, if this is how you're thinking about this claim, just tell yourself, I don't understand it unless the way the outside wants me to understand unless, okay? Even though your intuitions might resist, might, might protest and say, no, that can't be right. Like what kind of mother would say this to her daughter Wendy, you're not getting a puppy unless you get straight A's. And then Wendy happily comes home reporting straight A's and the mother says, wait, 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 I never said if you got straight A's, I'm giving you a puppy. What I actually said was, if you didn't get straight A's, you're not getting a puppy. You got straight A's, great. You're still not getting a puppy, right? That, that would be perhaps some kind of child abuse, but that's the LSAT. It's child abuse. In the world in which Wendy does get straight A's, like, I don't want to use this arrow because um, the arrow is meant to be if that she could get a puppy or she could not get a puppy. Just like in the previous sentence, in the world in which the governor of South Carolina gives us a tax deal, right, gives us a tax deal, maybe we build it in New York, maybe we don't build it in New York. It's not clear. If we don't get that tax deal, for sure we're building in New York. But if we do get the tax deal, it's unclear. Why is that, right? You might be like, why is that? How could that possibly be? I mean, you, you can, this is actually a fairly deep philosophical investigation. And if you're curious to find out more, you can look up strong unless versus weak unless, okay? Strong versus weak unless. But for the purposes of the LSAT, just understand that that's how unless is meant to be read. Unless is meant to be read where if you fail one of the conditions, the other condition triggers Right? If you fail one of the conditions, the other condition triggers. So if Wendy doesn't get straight A's, the other condition triggers. She's not getting a puppy. If you satisfy one of the conditions, the unless claim is silent. Okay, I want you to remember this, this word, this, this way of describing the claim. The, the claim is silent. If you satisfy one of the conditions, what happens with the other condition? The claim is silent, means it doesn't say anything. Maybe she's getting a puppy, maybe she's not getting a puppy. As much as your intuitions kick back against this, as much as your intuitions say, that's horrible parenting, what the hell's wrong with that mother? 
how can you say that to your dog? Like, it doesn't matter, okay? That's just how it is on the LSAT. Um, now, incidentally, the LSAT writers aren't dumb. They recognize the inherent ambiguity baked into a sentence like this, especially the strong context associated with a claim like this, where you think a mother wouldn't be saying that to a child. And so their solution, the LSAT writer's solution, is just avoid claims like this. You're, you're, you're likely to not see a claim like this on the LSAT because of the ambiguity of how do I interpret this unless? Do I interpret the strong version or the weak version? Whereas the previous claim about South Carolina and New York, it was way less ambiguous. It seems pretty obvious in that, even intuitively. I don't think you kicked back this hard when I told you that if your negotiator came back with the deal from the governor of South Carolina, you could still build in New York or not. I mean, that's up to you, right? See, because that claim is just somehow less ambiguous. So that's the kind of claim you're going to see on the outside. N not really something like this. But I bring this up because I, I want to drive home the importance of treating unless the way the outside writers want you to treat unless, which is, again, to say, negate sufficient.